So today I'm going to talk about something that is really, really near and dear to my heart that I am incredibly passionate about, especially recently. So those of you guys who have heard me speak probably in the last few months even, whether it be a couple minutes up here in opening or whether it be in Bible hour or whether it be on a Wednesday night, I've talked about my experience and my transformation in my growth and faith from sort of I focused to God focused, and I've been using sort of this experiencing God type of language to describe it, right? Where I used to be, okay, it's all about me and what God has planned for me, and it's me and God, you got to help me accomplish my goals and my purpose. That's how I sort of used to think my whole Christian life. And the reality is I've come to realize that's all wrong. I mean, it's literally completely wrong. Even though I had, I think you could probably hear, I had good intentions, right? But it was all wrong. So I think the, 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 the new sort of way that I realized that this is the way God wants it to be is he's working all around us, right? You've heard me say that, right? All around, all of us, every day, 24-7, 365, he is working around us. And it's just up to us to humble ourselves, to surrender our hearts to him so that we can figure out what he's doing and then I can just join him. You can just join him in his plans and his ways. And I've come to realize, like most things, God is a simple God. He is a God of order. And he really just wants two things. He's looking to save the lost with his plans and strengthen the found. I mean, obviously he's looking to do millions and millions of other things. But if you boil it down, is there anything else he's really after? in his ways and his purposes, save the lost, strengthen the found. And who is the lost? Well, we know those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Who's the found? Those who have. And we need strengthening both for ourselves and to share the gospel everywhere else. So if we're going to do that, there's a few steps we have to do. Number one, we have to have an intimate, personal relationship with God the Father. And it's got to be continuous and growing. And if we have that relationship, then we can hear him when he calls us, when he speaks to us. And then we have our choice to make. Are we going to obey him? And when we obey his call, then we can experience God and we can join his plan, which I'm telling you, if you look carefully, is always going to come down to one of these two things, saving the lost or strengthening the found. So how does this relate to prayer? Well, I have learned step one of that process after you realize that God is working all around you is you have to have that intimate personal relationship with him and you cannot have it without prayer. So when that sort of hit me, it was like a, it was like a gut punch to me because I realized my prayer life is weak and I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to venture to guess your prayer life isn't as strong as it could be either. And if our prayer life isn't as strong as it could be, then we're in trouble because we can't do step one and have that intimate personal relationship with God, right? So I actually really started to, to think about this. And I started looking around both inwardly at myself, at other Christians and the rest of the world. And I totally believe that we are in a prayer crisis. Next slide. I can give you data point after data point after data point about prayer and crisis. But I love this one simply because of what I have there in bold at the end, weekly. I don't know about you guys, but there's some trigger words that I have in my life. And one of them is like, you call me weak or you think I'm weak. I hate that. I don't know what it is. I mean, and I don't even mean like physical strength. I mean, maybe a little just because yeah, I think all guys just want to be strong. But it's mostly like you call me weak, like psychologically or mentally or spiritually weak. It's almost like you guys remember Back to the Future. He could take anything, but if they called him a chicken. That's when he like, <laughs> he couldn't take it anymore, right? <laughs> well, me, for me, it's weekly. So I just chose this, but I literally could give you hundreds of studies on this, uh, of, of how prayer is in crisis. So this one is just like, listen, only 69% say that they're praying weekly. When I say weekly, I mean like once a week. Can you imagine? I, was where I, I knew that I was praying weekly, and I was praying daily. And then I love the line at the end. In light of that we know about church attendance and Bible reading, we can affirm that this 69% that's praying weekly, they're praying weekly, like the insult weekly. Weaklings. How can that be? We, can't, we cannot let this go on. So prayer is in crisis. So then I said, all right, prayer is in crisis. Why? Why is prayer in crisis? I don't understand. I got to figure this out. Next slide. 
Then I started thinking, prayer is in crisis for the world because the same reason it was in the crisis for me. I forgot the why and the how about prayer. You might say, what are you talking about? What is this garbage? Well, let me give you the details. Why is our purpose. It's our motivation. It's our passion. And if you don't have a why behind whatever you're doing, that mission, that motivation, that passion, you're dead. You're dead on arrival. You're not going to succeed because you're not going to figure out the how, which is the mastery, which is to give you the confidence that you can actually achieve the results that you're looking to achieve. We know this in all of life, right? How many of you, job is probably the easiest. How many of you have had a job that you didn't have a strong passion for? You just went maybe because I needed a paycheck. Anybody ever have a job like that in their life? Yeah, we probably all have, right? Right? I, I know I did, right? But when you find your passion, that's a different story. So I remember this started for me when I was a teenager. I got my first job. Why? Literally, I don't know. My parents told me I needed a summer job and that's what everyone else was doing. So I went and got a summer job. Junior Speedway. Never forget. Junior Speedway. I let people on and off the go-karts. I hated it. I was so bored. I had no passion. I didn't care about go-karts. I didn't care about... Like, it was nothing that drove me. And I remember being like, I hate this. I got to do something different. I didn't know what. Then one day, probably about a year and a half later, I'm on the beach and I look up and I see a kid. He looked just like me, except he was high above on a lifeguard chair, right? And he was looking over the whole beach. And I was like, man, he's in charge here. And everybody's safety is kind of, you know, contingent upon this guy doing his job. And I was like, that's me. That's my next summer job. I want to be a lifeguard. I want to be able to save lives. I want to be able to like make sure people are safe here at the beach. So what did I do? I had my why. I had my passion. I had my motivation. I learned how. And I went to lifeguard school and I learned how to swim and I learned how to do CPR and all these things that I never knew how to do before that. I had my why and I had my how. And then when I went to work, I loved going to work. I was passionate about going to work. And by the way, then I wanted to be the best. I want to be the best lifeguard. And I felt a real sense of responsibility, that real why and how. And then it carried me through my whole life. I didn't find my real sort of why in work until I went to work in the ER. At first, I thought I wanted to be a coach and then a gym teacher and a trainer, all these different things. But until I was in the ER and I literally knew people's lives were in my hands and I was changing lives, I didn't really hit my stride because I had my why. I was passionate and I was motivated. And because of that, I wanted to be the best. People's lives are in my hands. I got to be the best. So I learned the how and I wanted to be the absolute best so that I had the confidence that I could deliver on those results. So you say, Keith, what are you talking? How do we get back to prayer? <laughs> well, let me explain to you. I lost my why and how on prayer, and I think the rest of us have as well. Next slide. Anybody remember this show? Know this show? It still runs, right? Shark Tank, right? And in Shark Tank, in case of you don't know who that is, is a show where you know you go on as your business or your idea, and you tell them and you pitch them about your business or your idea or your solution. And what do you know about one of the first things that these folks will say? Because today, well, if, if you were the sharks, what would I be pitching? Prayer, right? I'd be pitching prayer. But what the first thing they'd say is, whoa, 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 Keith, before you tell me about your solution, your product, prayer, is there a problem? Because if, if you don't have a problem that you're solving, nobody's going to care about your solution. So the first thing that Shark Tank teaches is, is there a problem? Let me give you an example in case I'm still not hitting home. How many of you took a picture in the past month? Almost everybody, good. How many of you used one of these big, nice, fancy cameras now that they, they got out? Not many, right? What'd you use? Your phone, right? But these companies started, even in the last few years, building these big, fancy cameras. Guess what? They all went out of business. Why? Because they didn't solve a problem. You didn't have a problem. I didn't need their big fancy camera. I could take it with my phone. Out of business. Dead on arrival. So is there a problem that we need prayer for? Oh, there's a problem. We'll get to it. How about this? You may have a problem, but you could get the problem all wrong. I got another question for you guys. How many of you watched a movie in the last month? Good. Me too. How many of you went to Blockbuster to get that movie? Nobody? 
Oh, that's because there is no Blockbuster. They died. You know the story of Blockbuster, right? Well, when Netflix and streaming started to come out, Blockbuster, for those of you who don't even know who that is, you could go rent, I think you could actually even rent videos, but that was before my time. My was DVDs, I go rent a DVD at Blockbuster, right? Or 10 bucks, I rent a DVD, I come home, stick it in, watch it, and I got to bring it back. And they came out, Netflix and streaming came out, and Blockbuster said, I'm not worried about that. They're just trying to price me out of the market. I'm going to lower my prices. I'm going to make these videos now like three, four, five bucks. Well, guess what? They're dead because they got the problem wrong. We didn't care about price, right? What do we care about? Convenience. Exactly. So you can't just recognize that there is a problem. You have to get the problem right. If you really want to know your why. So if we want to know why prayer is such a huge solution for us as Christians, then we need to know what the problem is very specifically. Next slide. You guys know this guy? Arguably the most intelligent man of all time. And he is quoted for saying, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the actual problem and only five minutes about the solution. Why? Because I just told you, you could have the most beautiful solution camera in the world. Who cares if there's no problem? Or you could have the most amazing solution in the world like Blockbuster and DVDs. But if it's the wrong problem that you're solving, the solution's dead. Next slide. Do we have a problem? Oh, we got a big problem, guys. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Adversary, the devil. Guys, this is our problem. And in fact, it, it actually almost it sends, like, chills down my spine to even call it a problem. I feel like that's like underestimating it. That's why it's a battle. Problem? Problem is what Blockbuster had or a video game or, you know, even a sports game. This is a battle. This is a big battle and a big problem. But this is our problem. Make no mistake about it. And it is a battle that we are in every single moment of our lives. Next slide. Don't believe me that it's a battle? Now, this is revelation, so this is prophecy. But if every word of God in the Bible is true, then I don't care if it happened, it's happening, or it's going to happen. This is fact, right? So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I know you can't read it all. So Revelation 12, 7 through 12, if you're following along. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. It's a war. It's a battle. Down at the bottom. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Next slide. Revelation again, 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make what? War. With the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Guys, if Jesus, if God the Father and his angels call it a war, our almighty, unstoppable Lord and Savior calls it war, you think we stand a chance against this? He's got a war. We are nothing. We are completely dead on arrival without him because the devil is our adversary and he is so powerful and we do not stand a chance against him without our Lord and our Savior in prayer. Next slide. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Guys, the devil is a murderer. We're at war with a murderer. I just want you to understand the gravity of it. Because this is why I started to get my why and my passion back for prayer. This is the problem. This is not like any other problem you will ever face. Because it's the problem. Next slide. 
All right, so I think we can all agree prayer is not that big camera, right? We got a problem. We have a serious problem. But in order to recognize that we don't have the wrong problem, like Blockbuster, right? We're not picking finances over convenience. We got to make sure we're fighting the right problem. We got to make sure we're fighting the right battle. And one of the best ways to ensure that we're fighting the right battle, which is the evil one, the devil, is to first recognize where you and I usually screw up. What battle do we usually fight, including using prayer as our solution, instead of the real battle we should be fighting? Next slide. Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? His little conniving strategies and plans. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Next slide. 2 Corinthians 10.3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So what are these two verses telling us? Where do we screw this up? Where do we call our problems? What do we war against? The flesh. See, if you're anything like me, you think your problems are fleshly. You think they're your anxiety, your depression, your husband, your wife your other relatives, your finances, your job. I could go on and on, right? Who's got problems, right? We think those are our problems. But I got news for you. If you think that's your problem, then he's already won. You're blockbuster. You are dead on arrival. That is not your problem. Those earthly things are simply the way the devil is making you think that that's your problem. But he's your problem. He's your problem. Again, don't take my word for it. The scriptures are clear. We do not war against the flesh. And all of those things that I just told you and so many more, we are warring. We are warring and we are using our solutions like prayer against fleshly, earthly things. When we need to realize we're in a spiritual battle, a life or death battle. Next slide. So, so very specifically, in case I didn't scare you enough, what is he after? Matthew 22, 37 and 38 says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. What does the devil do? He's coming after your heart and your soul and your mind. Why? Because that's what Jesus wants from us. God wants our heart our soul, and our mind to be solely for him. In fact, he calls it his greatest commandment. So the devil is coming after your heart, your soul, and your mind. If you think he's messing with your anxiety, your depression, your pain, your suffering, your relationships, nah, he's got you sidetracked. He's got you fooled. You already lost. He's coming after your heart, your soul, and your mind. And those problems that you have, they are just manifestations of that he's got a hold of your heart your soul, and your mind. And you should be scared because he mimics God, right? We know that. That's what the devil does. That's how he comes out. He mimics God. So he goes, okay, God's after this. That's what I'm after. Next slide. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Double click on it. Next slide. Triple click on it. Keep your heart with all diligence. In other versions, it says guard your heart. For your heart springs life. Next slide. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, scripture after scripture after scripture tells us God is after our hearts, our souls, and our minds. So is the devil. Next slide. Psalm 129, 23 to 24. I love this because those of you know, I love David. He was a heart after God, right? David had a heart after God. Here's a perfect example. This is David praying. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You guys willing to do that? You willing to ask God to search your heart? 
You see, I think a lot of times that, that scares us because the truth is, even if we recognize all of what I said up to this point, how many times do we kind of just, we live in fake land. I'll, I'll call it it's just fake. I act a certain way, but God knows our hearts. God's looking at your heart. You may act. Oh, lovey-dovey with my family or my wife or whatever it is. And then, but deep down in your heart, husbands, do you love your wife like Christ loved the church? Do you sanctify her? Do you mean set her apart, cleanse her? Do you wash her with the word? Is that what's really in your heart? Do you love her that deeply? Wives, do you completely submit to your husbands in all reverence in love? Because that's what God's looking at. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at your heart and your mind. He's not looking what you're doing. You may act like I've got a no, no care in the world, but then you go home and you worry constantly about relationships or your finances or anything. He's won. The devil has won if that's what's going on. Because remember, he's after your heart. He doesn't care what's out to the world. And David knew that. That's why I love David. He's like, Lord, search me deep. How about that for accountability? David is being accountable. Next slide. All right. If I haven't sufficiently got you passionate and motivated like I am now about prayer, basically through scaring you, I hope, <laughs> that the devil is real. He's scary. We're in a war. He's a murderer. And he's out for what? Your hearts, your minds, and your souls. How about more why? Jesus said so. The word of God says so. Over 500 times prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Another hundred ask is mentioned. And what is ask? Pray. Our God Almighty told us. Uh, there's another why for you. Next slide. At this point, I thought it was probably important to at least mention as we move into prayer, who's prayer for? And this may touch a nerve with some people, but that's okay. Prayers for the saved and the righteous. What do I mean by that? Number one, if you are not saved, which means... You have not accepted Jesus Christ into your hearts. You have not repented of your sins, admitted that you need a Savior, admitted that He is the only way, and then turned your life over to Him and given it to Him. He, had, he does not hear your prayers. He does not hear your prayers. He, there's only one prayer He hears then, when you pray that prayer. That's the only prayer He'll hear. And I'm sorry to tell you that, but if, if you're even praying for the lost in any other way, don't pray for their circumstances. Don't pray for that. That's, that's ridiculous. Pray for their souls. Pray that they pray that salvation prayer someday and get Jesus in their heart. Because if they don't do that, God will never hear a prayer. That is the only prayer of the unsaved that God will hear. Never forget that. Number two, this one might be a little harder, right? He only hears the prayers of the righteous. Well, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you, John 9, 31. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God, and does his will, he hears him. Ooh, does not hear sinners. Ouch. That's nothing. Look at this next one. Proverbs 28, 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, which means obeying the word of God, his prayer is an abomination. <gasps> Seriously? He does not hear the prayer of sinners. And in fact, if you do, it's an abomination to him. Well, you say, Keith, how could that be? Aren't we all sinners? Yeah, we are. So what that means is, have you repented of your sin? Are you praying to God after you've brought your sins to him, confessed your sins? Or are you living in unrepentant sin? It's saying, dear Lord, help me. But you haven't done step one that he asked you to do, which is repent of your sin. Because that's what makes us righteous. We're not righteous. We are just dirty rags. Let's be honest. I know I am. So are you though. It's just the truth. But you become righteous when you ask for forgiveness. And when you ask for forgiveness, now he's going to hear your prayers. So you've got to make sure that he's hearing your prayers. So number one, you got to make sure you're saved. Number two, you've got to ask for repentance. And you've got to cleanse your heart. You've got to be justified because he sees you white as snow after you do that. And then the gates open to prayer. Next slide. All right. More. You need more reasons? You're still not convinced that prayer, you don't have your why yet? 
I'll give you another one. We can't read all this. It's too small for you to read anyway. But I'm just going to hit. This is, again, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, which I love for multiple reasons. You'll probably figure out why. Number 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Skip down to 13, the whole armor of God. 14, gird your waist with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel. Take the shield of faith. Helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, why do I love that? Because I just told you it's a battle. It's a battle. And God is telling us it's a battle. Do you need to put on armor if you're going to work today in business? If you're going to do anything else in life? When is the only time we need armor? If we're in a battle. If we're in a battle. And then down at 18, now you really know why I love it. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You see... Despite all of this armor, what does he say at the end? We need prayer always in all things. By the way, how do you think you're going to get this full armor of God? You think he's just going to miraculously appear? You've got to pray for it. And then once you have it, you've got to pray to keep it. Next slide. This is my last why. Because by now, I really believe you've got it. But in case you don't have a why yet, why did Jesus come to the earth? Came for two reasons, right? Number one, to save our souls. Number two, to show us an example of how to live our lives. And I'll tell you what, I want to be like Jesus. I don't know about you guys. I want to be like Jesus. So if I didn't have enough why before, I got my why right here. Mark 135, did Jesus pray? Oh, he prayed. <laughs> now in the morning, Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed in a solitary place, and there he prayed. Prayed in the morning. Next slide. God bless you. Now, it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and continually all night he prayed to God. He prayed in the morning. He prayed at night. Next slide. He always prayed. However, the report went around concerning him all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmaries. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Guys, Jesus is our example. And if you look, I mean, I just brought three verses, but there is verse after verse after verse, example after when Jesus was here on earth. He's Jesus. He's the king of all kings. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he needed to constantly pray in order to win the spiritual battle. If Jesus needed it, you think you need it? You think I need it? I got lots of why. Next slide. All right, now we're going to move on to the how. Right? All right, we, we got our why. I hope you are passionate. You are motivated. You understand there is a big problem. And it is an actual battle. It's not even a problem. And what's it a battle for? It's a battle for your hearts, your minds, and your souls. It is life or death battle. And Jesus is our example. And God the Father told us, I'm motivated. I'm passionate. I'm ready to go. But now how? How do I master this skill of prayer? How do I apply it? Right? What's pastor say? What's he saying? Knowledge without application is frustration. So if all you are is pent up passion, pent up motivation, but you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to win the fight, you don't have the right strategy, then you're just going to be frustrated. So let's talk about it. Lucky for us, God tells us in his word exactly how to pray. Next slide. So I think the first thing we need to recognize is this. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So, everything, what's pastor say? All means all, and that's all, all means, something like that. Everything. So, let's make sure, if we're going to have prayer as our solution, we're praying about everything. There's no such thing as little prayers. 
Not when we're fighting the deadly adversary of the devil. So we pray in absolutely everything because the word of God tells us. Next slide. Sometimes I just love how simple God's word is. It's like a two-year-old. We learned this when we were two. How do we pray very specifically? Thank you, please. I'm sorry. That's it. You say, oh, that's not it. No, that's it. That's actually it. That's how God wants us to pray. That's the template. I'm like, that can't be it. No, I'm telling you, that's it. Next slide. This, again, probably too small for you to read, but Jesus told us exactly how to pray. Now, you got to be careful here. This is not like a prayer of repetition. This is not, you are not to pray this prayer. What God is telling us, what Jesus, what God told Jesus <laughs> to tell us was this is the template. This is the outline of how we should pray. Because he said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that? That is thank you and praise you, right? Next, he says, give us this day our daily bread. What's that? Please. You're asking for something, right? Lord, give me what I need. Next, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What are debts? He's talking about sin. Forgive us our sin, right? I told you, if you don't come with a repentant heart, your prayer's done. It's dead on arrival. I'm sorry. That's what that is. Lord, I am sorry. Forgive me and help me forgive others. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What is that again? That's asking. That's saying, please, Lord, deliver me. And then finally, how does it end? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you and praise you. See, I told you. Please thank you and I'm sorry. Basic, but so powerful. This is what Jesus told us, how we are to pray. And again, not this prayer. Again, how do I know? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is the prayer he wants us to pray. No, next slide. Too much to go into here. I didn't even put it up here, but I really, really encourage you to go read John chapter 17, the entire chapter. Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He didn't just do as I say, but not as I do. No, he did. John chapter 17 is probably the, if not the only, it's definitely the most obvious place where we see Jesus' actual prayer. He's The whole chapter in John, in John 17 is Jesus actually praying. It, not, not like the other verses where I said, where it told us that he went to go pray. It's his actual prayer. How cool is that, that we actually get to see one of Jesus' prayers? But we do. It's in John chapter 17. And if you look carefully at it, again, too much to go through today, but he did the same thing, man. He did the same thing in that prayer. He said all the template. He used the template that he told us to pray. So he walked the walk. So that is our template. That's how we're to pray. Next slide. All right. You say, I need more. I need more, Keith. I need more specifics. I get it but I don't fully, fully get it. I, I got to, I, I need more. All right. We need to pray with all our hearts. Why? Jeremiah 29, 12, 13 is just one verse that gives us the example. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. Let's be honest. How many of us pray everything, every prayer, all the time, with all our heart. It's hard. I got to tell you, some of my prayers are, and I know you guys fall into this. Thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. Um, please help me at work and help me to do okay. We do that sometimes, right? No way. No way. That is not how we are to pray. Not even close. Right? We should be on our knees. We should be praying like this. Oh, dear Lord Almighty, God of gods, King of kings, Savior of saviors, Lord, 
I beg of you, I need your help. I cannot beat the devil on my own. He is killing me. He is destroying my life. He's destroying my, my relationship. He is destroying my, my, my this, my that. Lord, you pick me up and carry me. Help me put on this armor and then lift me through this battle, Lord. I cannot do it. Like That's the kind of prayer we need to be praying. With all our hearts. We don't always do that, but that's the prayer. That's the way we got to pray. Next slide. And then, guys, we got to have confidence in the results. Because here's the other thing. If I were to dive into each one of your hearts, how many of you are praying with 100% confidence? It's coming true. No doubt. It's happening. My prayer is being answered, I should say. It's coming true. It could be misleading. But my prayer is being answered. We got to have the confidence. James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Whew. What is he saying here? He's saying we got to have confidence. We can't pray, oh, dear Lord, you know, I, I hope you hear me and hope you answer my prayer. No. If we are praying, the, 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 the reason and the why and the how, the way we've been talking about here, we've got to have confidence. He's going to answer our prayers. That's what he says. It may not be the way you want it answered. It may not be the way or the time you want it answered, but he's going to answer prayers. If you're coming to him the right way, he says you've got to have the confidence. Next slide. All right. I love this too. I love this. Why else should we have confidence? The Lord our God who goes before us, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. What is this scripture telling us? It says he will fight for you. Why should you have confidence? He's going to fight the devil. If you ask him, He's going to fight for you. Because what is this, these examples here? In Egypt, before your eyes, and in the wilderness? He's talking about the Israelites battling the flesh. Fight the Egyptians? The Israelites, no chance. Survive in the wilderness? No way. But he will fight for you. So you see, back to the whole thing that we screw up. My anxiety, my depression, my pain, my suffering, my illness, my relationships, my finance. Stop fighting those battles. They are not your battles. Pray to the Lord to win the real battle, the battle for your heart, your soul, and your mind. And those other things, I don't know how, I don't know when, but he will fight for you and he will defeat those things. They're, they are not going to be your conqueror. If you pray to the Lord the right way, in that close relationship, he's going to fight the battles for you, just like he fought for the Israelites. Next slide. All right, I'm going to land on these next two slides for a few minutes because this was a moment for me. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. What's the Spirit? The Holy Spirit. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Whew. So when you pray, do you really know what I thought? Like, remember I said God's working all around us? He's working all around. Do you really know what he's doing? Besides at a high level, like I said, like we know. He's saving the lost and he's strengthening the found. Do you really, really know everything? No, you don't. But the Holy Spirit does, right? So the Holy Spirit is going to help you pray. If you pray with all your heart and your mind, the Holy Spirit is going to help you pray the right prayers. 
That blew my mind. Next. This one's even better. Who is he who condemns? This is Romans 8, 34 and 35. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Guys, you know what this is saying? Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for me and you. Who's he praying to? God the Father. He's making intercession for us. All right. Now get this. This is what really got me pumped. So when I pray, are you telling me the Holy Spirit is there helping me pray? And Jesus is there accepting my prayers and praying for me to God the Father? Guys, the Holy Trinity is with us when we pray. Is there any other time that you can confidently say the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God the Father is with me right now, right this second? How could prayer not be the solution? I mean, that just blew my mind and got me so pumped. And I'm like, every time I sit down and pray with all my heart, the Holy Spirit is helping me pray to Jesus. And then Jesus is praying to God the Father for me? All three, the Holy Trinity, the Lord of Lords, is right there with me when I pray. How can the devil stand a chance? I'll answer the question. He can't. How can you lose that battle? You can't. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that is just like awe-inspiring to me when I read that. And when I kind of put it all together. Like, how could you not? Like, it makes me want to like, like, we should just like stop. We, we are. We're going to stop. We're going to pray right now. Bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, man, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for helping us through your Holy Spirit know that you're at work. You're at work all around us right now in this room. Oh, Lord, and thank you for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sits at your right hand. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for allowing us to come boldly. And Lord, finally, thank you. Thank you that you give us Jesus, who I know is praying to you for me. Lord, man, help me win my battles, not on my own accord, but through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and of course, you, Lord, God, Father. Amen. Next slide. Finally, in prayer strategy, this is another one I would screw up, so I wanted to make sure I said it. Don't stop! How many times... Are we like, you don't even know it, but like you're climbing a mountain. You're like right at the peak. You just can't see it because there's some clouds and you stop. And you roll all the way back downhill. The word of God is full of scripture that says, do not stop. Right? Luke 18, 1, he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Now, if you know anything about this parable, this was really a, a, a woman who really had nothing to lose and poor and, and she kept going to the rich judge and powerful judge and going before him and he was like, nope, 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 nope. And she kept coming and she kept coming and she kept coming and she kept asking. And finally, he's like, all right, your persistence wins. Now, this, this is not a parable to say, hey, just keep bugging God. Lord, please give me those... Give me that new big truck. <laughs> please, please give me this promotion. Please, please help whatever. And if you keep bugging God, he's going to, like, that's not what this parable is saying. But what this parable is saying is the rich, powerful, the evil, they don't stand a chance. You just keep coming and you keep praying. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Again, over and over again, we see, man, I know for a fact you make this mistake. You have to, you're human. And we're in prayer crisis, I've already shown you. Don't stop if you're praying and you're praying the right way with the right motivation with the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and God the Father by your side. Do not stop. Man, I cannot tell you how many times we screw this up because we just don't have the persistence in prayer. 
Next slide. Here's another one we screw up. We don't, we pray and we don't even watch for the results. Be honest. I can't even tell you that. I pray and I move on. What are you doing? Like watch for the results. In fact, I tell you, you should write down your prayers. You should have a prayer journal and you should write them down. You should write the date and time. And then when you see that he answered or begin answering, go write that down and write that. You will be shocked at how often he is answering your prayer and you don't even know it. You don't even know it because you're just so busy or you're so stressed or you're, you moved on to the next thing. I love these two verses. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church for Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Next verse is Isaiah 55, 8, 9. Sorry, it's up here, guys. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So what is he saying here? In Ephesians, he's saying, I'm going to do far more than you even realize. If you're praying the right way, Lord, I am weak. I got nothing without you and your armor. Get this devil out of my anxiety, out of my relationship, out of my life. If you're praying that way. He's going to do more than you even think. So you could miss it because he's doing something bigger. I got a little goofy example, but like I was just baseball wise, like I, you know, I was coaching my kids this summer and I remember we were big game, big, big game. My son was, you know, one of the best players on the team and he was up at a spot where if he got a hit, we probably could win the game. And he actually struggled that game, you know, and he was, he already was like 0 for 2. And I just remember like, man, like, oh, Lord, man, Lord, just, just help him, help him, help him, Lord. Boom, pops up, out. And I'm like, Oh, well, unanswered prayer. Like, literally, that's what I said to myself. Like, right? And then literally, next inning, I forgot all about it. I look over, and there's my son. And I listen, it, it's hard. I mean, he's, he's not a preacher yet. Nowhere near it. He's working on his faith, too. He's sitting there in the dugout where everyone can see his guy's head down, and he is praying. And I was just like, I just, I felt like guilt. Like, I thought God didn't answer my prayer because he didn't get a stupid hit. He was doing exceedingly abundant things. His thoughts were so much higher than mine. I was thinking about a hit. God was working in his heart and wanted him to humble himself and pray and maybe be a witness to his other teammates because it was obvious he was praying. How many times are we not watching for the results? Because maybe we think the results should be A, but it's really B. Or more likely, it's we think it's A and it's A plus, 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 plus. <laughs> That's really what it usually is. So let's do this. Next slide. Why is now the time? I don't know, man, about you guys, but it hit me like a ton of bricks when I realized I was in prayer crisis. And one of the reasons was, man, look around. I don't know how much time we have left. I mean, look at, look at the world around us. Look at the government. Look at academia. Look at the media. Look at the world, honestly, and even look at a lot of churches. This is not good. We know the time is soon. So I got a whole nother, after I got all my whys and I was in and I was motivated and I was passionate, I was ready to go, I got a whole nother why. Urgency. We need to have some urgency about our solutions like prayer. We really do. Because Matthew 24, 44 says, Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Are you ready? Do you know what your problem is? Do you know what your real battle is? And are you praying as your solution? for that intimate, personal, and continually growing relationship with God to defeat the evil one? You see, because God needs his disciples. He needs us. Remember the very first slide I said? 
saving the lost and strengthening the found. First, we got to strengthen ourselves before I strengthen anybody else. So I got to get that personal relationship, intimate personal relationship through prayer so that I can strengthen myself, then I can strengthen others, then I can save souls. That's what he needs us to do with urgency because I don't know how much time we have left. So there's one more why. But I'm going to end on this note. Next slide. Are we in a battle? Oh, you better believe we're in a battle. We are in the battle of a lifetime against the biggest enemy, the biggest, baddest enemy, the worst of the worst, the devil. And it's a real battle, and you're in it every day, and he's after your heart, your mind, and your soul. He's a murderer and a liar. He's coming after you at a deeper level than you even realize. He's not coming after your little problems. He's coming after your hearts and your minds and your souls. And we are in a battle. But, and oh boy, this is a big but. That didn't sound right. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> it is. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Because in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. He's overcome the world. So guess what? The war's already won. It's over. He already won on the cross. He did it. It's over. The war is already run. But we have to fight these battles every day, every single day to save more of the lost, to strengthen ourselves and strengthen more of the found because he won the war, right? He won that war. So you got to have supreme confidence that he won that war and go to battle knowing you're going to win. You do it his way. It's over. We won. He won on the cross by shedding his blood. Hmm. I don't know about you, but that, there's no better way to end than that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, man, we begin, Lord, with the end. And the ending is you win, Lord. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, Lord, so that we could have eternal life with you. Lord, you won the battle, Lord. And we need to strengthen ourselves so we can strengthen others. And we want everybody on your team. We don't want anybody left off your team, Lord. Lord, I ask that you give us the strength and the courage to strengthen ourselves, to strengthen our fellow brethren, and to go out and save more lost. Because if anybody is on the losing side, then it should break our hearts. We want everybody on your team, Lord, on the winning team. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, who has not accepted you as your Lord and Savior, I want to give them that chance right now. So if anyone in this room, again, every, every eye closed, every head bowed, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and today you want to, today you want to give your heart and your mind and your soul to him once and for all, then pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. I have failed you. I am a mighty, mighty sinner. And Lord, I need a Savior. Oh, and Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for me so that I could be saved, so that I could be forgiven, so that I could be washed clean as snow. And Lord, I accept that forgiveness that you gave me. I accept it into my heart, and therefore I accept you, Jesus, into my heart as my Lord and as my Savior forever and ever. If you prayed that prayer, raise your hand. If you 
are already saved. But you need a reset. You know you're in prayer crisis. You know you don't have that intimate personal relationship with God so that you can fight the evil on the way you should. Maybe you even need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ today. Raise your hand so I can pray for you. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, for those who raised their hand today, who said, Lord, I'm in a prayer crisis. Lord, I need a reset. Lord, I need to recommit my life to you. Lord, I ask that while you be with everyone in this room, you be especially with those people that raise their hands. Lord, you, through your Holy Spirit, move in them. Show them where you're working. Speak to them clearly. And Lord, give them the courage to reset their life, to recommit to you, to recommit to having a personal, intimate relationship with you, Lord. Lord, because we know you are with us, then who can be against us? Be with those people, Lord, who raise their hand. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you and we praise you for winning the war. In your amazing Son's name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.